So I'm going to sit because I'm going to sit. So my name is Molly Claypool. Thanks for having me here today. And my talk is called Discrete Automation. <clears throat> Hopefully, um, this will be a little bit more of a manifesto that Jill uh, asked for. We'll see. Um, as Jill said, I'm co-director of Design Computation Lab and our. So um, we can begin really looking at this idea of discrete automation through the digitization of the built environment. And when we do, I think we can see that a few contradictions appear. So if we think of architectural projects as buildings rather than purely as a practice of the academy or the speculative academy or the speculative institution, it's relatively obvious that the elements that make up a typical building are not assembled in a factory like an iPhone, Tesla, Amazon Alexa, any kind of the everyday objects that we use, digital objects that we use. And there's really very few um, exceptions to this. So despite these advances in technology and other industries, the physical production of our built environment remains very heavily reliant on people in the field on a building site. Now, architecture uses a model for labor that's highly analog, leaning on an unskilled, transient labor force that's in short supply around the world. Uh, the realization of buildings also really uses a framework for project delivery, the design build build framework that's really highly fragmented and reliant on the precise coordination of a heavily striated workforce of contractors, subcontractors, sub subcontractors, sub sub subcontractors. Now, logistically, this kind of framework creates an adversarial atmosphere where responsibility, liability, transparency are real obstacles towards streamlined and efficient um, collaboration. I think this idea was mentioned earlier between all the stakeholders in an individual project. So, the typical production chain for even small scale, scale projects, such as a house. Um, speaking to the, the typology that Jill mentioned in the beginning, are very much opaque, long, inefficient, and extremely costly to the vast majority of clients who don't have the expertise, knowledge, or understanding to comprehend the complexity of all the processes that are required to realize a building today. So everything really exists, let's say, behind um, the, an obscuring wall in the production of architecture. Now, if we move to a different model, which we'll sort of present later, then everything sort of becomes part in front of this obscuring wall. And the wall no longer exists. Now, the asymmetries that emerge from all of these conditions, when extrapolated to the global scale, are really driving inequity across the built environment, from who can afford specialist knowledge to the precarity created by the gig economy of construction. And furthermore, the incredibly high value um, placed on land which is increasingly, I would argue, acknowledged as a symbol of the inequities created by neoliberalism, means that these asymmetries are further regulated, further supported by a free and vastly unregulated market. And there's only now some serious work being done on this in the UK by activist George Mambiat and other economic experts who have made this most recent series of recommendations to the Labour government, well, Labour opposition government, in their very recent report. It's called Land for the Many. This report, years in the making, demonstrates the impact that regulation of land value can have on the stabilization of the disciplines of the built environment, such as in 2008 when construction industry in the UK fell into recession three times in a five-year period, despite general economic improvement in all the other industries worldwide. Now, architecture is complicit in, these, in all these asymmetries. Despite overwhelming precarity in the capitalist market, the discipline has yet to seek to innovate its very basic elements. The building blocks that make up buildings, slabs, beams, columns, etc., are designed, planned, manufactured, and assembled using processes that haven't changed much since the Industrial Revolution. And the very matter and the way that we conceive the elements of what consists, constitutes a building or a process of production, for one, has been relatively unaffected by the paradigm of digitization. The fixity of functional building elements remains a slab, is a slab, is a slab, is a slab. Now, some obviously are going to argue that this is a really absurd statement. Obviously, there is um, a certain proliferation of software alongside programming, big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, augmented and virtual reality, et cetera, that have had a really huge impact on the way that we conceptualize architecture. But when, when, when one looks at the most common tools that are being invested in now outside of the architectural industry, you find a focus on, on tools such as BIM, project management, or logistics. Oh. Okay. Oh, whatever. 
um, to deal with the complexities of these of these models. So this is a, a video from Pro Procore, which is Procore, which is the first project management um, investment unicorn, right? Had over a billion pounds invested in it, um, which is a really, it's a really funny video, if I can sort of get it to play. No, okay, doesn't matter. So, as has been really often historicized since by Carpo, Greg Lynn, um, loads of different people, these technologies were appropriated from computer sciences, shipbuilding, automobile industry, aeronautical industry, biology, science fiction, gaming. And in the words of architecture historian Alan Colquhoun, who died recently, this tendency towards seeking the laws of architecture outside of architecture itself isn't a new practice. This is something he said in 1977. It's not a new practice within architectural culture. Indeed, it has been apparent throughout modernity, and as Sean Keller recently described, this reaching outside from the discipline has been used as a way to legitimize the scale, expense, expertise, presence, and permanence of architecture. So we're using other things in order to legitimize architectural practice or, uh, or building. Now the splines, pixels, voxels, bits associated with digital innovation and technological progress has enabled architectural form to be reconceptualized not as a static, permanent object, but as a continuous state of flux, part of a larger network of data, communication between different kinds of systems. This is a very familiar idea now. Yet as digital architects began to win large, mainly cultural, civic, or other public commissions, such as Yokohama Port Terminal, or Bilbao, or Mercedes-Benz by UN Studio, it becomes really clear that the potential to transform what architecture is comprised of when realized as buildings largely settled into a kind of digital neoformalism, privileging the symbolic, aesthetic, effective, and the representational. Parametric software allows multiple inputs to be congealed into complex, blobby, unfamiliar forms whose meaning, meaning is often ascribed to or appropriated from the sciences or cinema. However, due to the discontinuity between the way that we design with digital tools and the way that these designs are realized, digital architecture needs to be post-rationalized in order to be realized using existing tools, techniques, and technologies of production. So post-rationalization thus becomes about maintaining an efficiency of resources in relationship to exuberance of form. Low in this hierarchy is a consideration of what form is comprised of or its parts. So such reduction of architectural realization to the ideologies of capital means that the whole formal architect object of architecture becomes privileged and is reliant on its justification as performative as beyond forces of capital. But in the last decade or so, architects have been very slow to understand the technology's power to transform shared understandings of the built environment if we begin to utilize technologies in ways that aren't constrained to existing assumptions or practices of what architecture and technology should be, it becomes apparent that many of the types of problems that we see in architecture have been solved elsewhere, from self-healing nanomaterials that repair themselves to aeroponic farming systems that enable the growth of food without soil. Only in the last several years has this slowness not precluded the possibility for digitization to help us rethink the very elements or basic pieces of architecture itself. Instead, a rich and fertile ground for the reconceptualization reconceptualization of the very basic elements of architecture has been proven in the project of the discrete. Yet rapid digitization in other industries, um, yet despite rapid digitization in almost all other industries, construction remains one of the least digitized, only one point uh, there above hunting, well, and agriculture, but that's worldwide, not just in the West. This is made most obvious when we look at construction's productivity levels or value added per worker, which have remained stagnant since the mid 20th century. The McKinsey Global Institute has reported that today the industry is in a deadlock. It will, to break it will require movement from all players. And resources are very quickly being dedicated to advancing automation and construction. In the UK alone, there was 170 million announced to be invested by the government's industrial challenge strategy fund in early 2019. So what does innovation and construction require in, in construction automation in particular? It requires a critical rereading of contemporary architectural culture. As Nick Cernick explains in his book, Platform Capitalism, which is a reference for a lot of our work, in order to understand our contemporary situation it is necessary to see what pre, what, with what preceded it. 
Phenomena that appear to be radical novelties may in light, in historical light, revo reveal themselves to be simple continuities. So as investment from venture capital and companies like WeWork, projects like Airbnb Backyard and Google Sidewalk Labs take control of our cities and modes of architectural realization in loosely regulated areas of the digital economy, using things like big data, lean platforms, and artificial intelligence, it's clear that without urgent engagement with the politics behind the current agents of change, the disciplines of, dis of the built environment will suffer a very big loss. Yet moves towards automation of labor in architectural design and construction tend to be approached as a kind of revivalist Taylorism for the sake of economic efficiency, replacing human labor through the automation of bricklaying or construction vehicle mobility with the single task robots. It's not difficult to look at the bricklaying robot SAM by construction robotics and draw a comparison to Villemar's vision of robotic production in the year 2000 series of postcards that were from 1910. Furthermore, increasing professionalization, legal responsibilities, and litigation has created a risk adverse climate of architectural production. This incredible, incredible conservatism continues to subsume innovation across the built environment with early modernist conceptions of architecture remaining the most common and standard form of construction. Now, so-called digital or parametric architecture tends to describe hugely inefficient and wasteful models for production. Parametric modeling's emphasis on infinite variability tends to combine with the whole to part conceptualization of the design that upon realization entails a massive amount of expensive custom building elements that require long production chains between material suppliers and manufacturers to realize. Companies who have attempted to innovate with shorter production chains often fall into tropes which have existed for much of the 20th century. For example, the platform oriented construction startup Patera utilizes a mode of vertical integration not dissimilar to Tesla to produce standardized factory-made building products that hark back to the mass prefabricated construction methods that date to 20th century projects like Levittown. And projects like WikiHouse utilize decentralized modes of production similar to the Fab Lab model, yet as it is a highly bespoke, non-scalable, and customized model for architectural production, it's really an incredibly rigid project. Furthermore, parametric architecture also has as its most public representation of politics which are antithetical to many architects in the generation of digital architects and theorists who, who have, for example, engaged actively with principles that der are derived from the open source community. Now, every technological... <sighs> this really needs to play. Ah, good. Every technological revolution gave insight from the failures and possibilities of previous generations. In architecture, for instance, the struggles and failures of modernism to deliver a united social project are lessons in the problematics of a rigid, universalist approach, and architecture is a form of top-down social engineering. Simultaneously, it is obviously the dull, dangerous, and dirty work of construction that can now be greatly improved through the harnessing of computational power for safer and more agile forms of production. Instead of falling stray to the more homogenous, striated, segregated, and equitable world that neoliberal perspectives on technology promote, and that is inherent in the previous generation of digital architecture, architecture should be working towards forms and processes of digital and automated production that move away from universalist, one-size-fits-all formalist approach, and instead promote the generic and prototypical as a means of facilitating and promoting practices of equity, heterogeneity, and inclusivity in architectural production. Today, the mass standardization of Mason Domino transformed the production of the post-war environment. Today, technologies of mass customization from the first digital turn mean that architects no longer have to think of space as being constructed of fixed elements. Instead, end users can embed their own agency into the way that spaces are shaped. Through prioritizing discrete part-to-whole relationships instead of the whole-to-parts thinking common to the smooth curvilinear or formalism of neoliberal parametricism, and universalist modernism. It requires the abstraction of architectural elements away from fixed functions and their redirection towards geometry, tectonics, performance, and behavior. It's an architecture that's open-ended, scalable, generic, and versatile. Embedded in cross-disciplinary discourse on, dis on digital materials, discreteness allows for a single set of building elements to re be contextualized, that is assembled, and recontextualized, that is disassembled and reassembled in different scenarios. In this case, the use of very light plywood and cardboard elements are used in order to quickly expand the shared plane of a co-living environment. 
The prototypical and generic nature of this discrete set of tectonic building elements enables the heterogeneity of contemporary life to impact and inform the realization of architectural space. This, uh, this understanding of architecture is the result of and a response to a crisis of objectivity. Digital architecture ultimately requires a new ontology of built space, one that allows for a different understanding of the ecology between things. The relationship between individual, society, and nature should not require and enforce predetermined hierarchies between parts, but instead emerge, as in many, as in many parts um, of the symposium, I think today will argue, through the idea of iterative accumulation, seriality, and the recombination in different conditions. With this approach, the dichotomy between the virtual, or the way things are designed, and the physical, the way things are realized, becomes much smaller. Methods and processes of design, fabrication, and assembly become more streamlined. The role of the architect becomes less concerned with the final, final form that a building might take, and instead engages more with the overarching economic, social, material, and technical framework in which it's produced. This project by our student Ivo Tedbury explored the deployment of discrete housing in a post-capitalist, post-work scenario of automation. And while conceiving of architecture through the discreteness of its parts is not necessarily a new idea, Combining it with ideas from open source software and other participatory models of production has the potential to engage and give agency to a wider set of project stakeholders, including inhabitants who can participate in its co-production over time. In this project by Osama El Koli, EPS foam parts were mediated through their utilization and deployment into housing and then cast into place as inhabitants negotiated their shared and public spaces. Automation here provides a ground in which discreteness can address architectural innovation and construction. Stagnancy in conceptualizing the digital and more effective methods for public engagement and processes of realization. Unlike fab labs or venues that host maker communities, commonly found around the world today, automation allows for a radical, large-scale, and horizontal rethinking of what the built environment is made of through an even larger framework that takes as its starting point questions of accessibility, scalability, and logistics. The notion of folk politics, or a politics that aims to bring politics down to the human scale by emphasizing temporal, spatial, and, immediate, and conceptual immediacy, for example, occup the Occupy movement is one of these, becomes very useful here as something to position ourselves away from. Automation works in the opposite direction of folk politics. It works out and up rather than in and down. As technology critic uh, Morozov has, has written, folk political models like the Fab Lab is an intrinsically neoliberal, mo neoliberal mode of production that suppresses the development of large-scale infrastructure by localizing production without considering how to enable knowledge transfer across the network. Folk politics like Fab Labs amplify individual personal experience over systemic change. Automation here differs from these models in its ability to engage wide audiences and deal with complex logistics. The automation gap is therefore a highly social and political space for rethinking all of our mechanisms of architectural production. In DCL and in our, our projects have developed multi-scalar production chains for automating the design and assembly of buildings, as well as space-making systems that are both socially engaged and economically disruptive to a given context. Other projects have developed novel fabrication and assembly methods using industrial and modular robotics, as well as platforms for logistical coordination between architectural elements on a large scale. Through automation, we ask the following questions. What would architecture look like if it engaged more rigorously with, the, with its inherited and, in, and inherent biases and its privileges? What could the social and economic and political consequences be of a discrete architecture's implementation and how we design, fabricate, and assemble buildings? How could automation help the disciplines of the built environment rethink how it engages with questions and problems of labor that we're facing today? Our work attempts to bridge this automation gap between how we live and how we produce the built environment. The research combines the, dis the generic and open-endedness of the, of the discrete with automation to speculate on how, labor's, how, on how to catalyze labor's obsolescence or new frameworks and, frame and forms of labor that are aligned with other types of society. Its emphasis on the qualitative and emergent qualities of cultural production over the quantitative and fixed or top-down brings the questions of why are we doing this and for whom are we doing this that were intentionally unanswered by the architects of the first digital turn and being actively answered now by the tech, tech companies of, the, of today. 
As the collective Laboria Cabonics wrote in 2015 with their manifesto, Xenofeminism, a Politics for Alienation, there's a need to, to, to strategically deploy existing technologies to re-engineer the world. Our research points to the argument that this isn't an impossible, impossible challenge, nor is it a free-floating project, since the frameworks already exist and have traction in the world. Many of the assumptions inherent to current discourse on socioeconomic and technological progress need to be overturned. An awareness of the various forces and actors at play in the automation of the built environment needs to be engaged with more rigorously and with less innocence. Automation must be contextualized in relationship to how it can and has been appropriated by capital. A truly digital architecture, a, dis a discrete architecture in the age of automation, understands implicitly that those in a state of disempowerment cannot prevail over the strong without any strategic coordination. Thank you.